May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I don't know if you've ever had this experience, but sometimes I'm sitting in church and I'll hear the words of our prayers or our songs as if it's for the first time. And sometimes it can really surprise or shock me. If this hasn't happened to you yet, be on the lookout because it probably will happen at some point. Most recently, this happened just a few weeks ago at this service. It was during the Eucharistic prayer, and I was standing behind the altar, and we sang the song, My flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed, says the Lord. And I don't know what it was about that moment, but the words sounded so incredibly weird to me. I even looked out into the congregation like, is anybody else noticing this? My flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. It was as if I was hearing it for the first time, like someone who had wandered in off the street, wondering, what do these people believe? And it brought to mind the critique of Christians for which early followers were actually persecuted, this thought that Christians are in some ways cannibals, eating flesh and drinking blood. And then today, in our gospel, we get the source of that statement itself, Jesus. If you've been coming to church for the past few weeks, you may have picked up on the fact that we keep hearing about bread and Jesus. For the past three weeks, and just so you know, we have two more weeks to go of basically the same gospel over and over again from the sixth chapter of John. But today, Jesus says, I am the bread of life that came down from heaven. And the bread that I give for the life of the world is my flesh. His words provoked the derision and confusion of his followers and listeners then, just as they still do in some ways for us today. And here I want to make a side comment, tangential in a way, but very important, just a word about translation. Because as Jeannie just read the gospel, this line may have jumped out to you. It definitely jumped out the first time I read it again, which said, the Jews began to complain about him. And now here we have to remember and perhaps learn that John, the writer of that gospel, was writing to a community of Jewish people. They were in the midst of a conflict within their sect about how to interpret their faith. And so perhaps a more responsible translation of the Jews would be the religious authority or the religious leadership, the religious insiders. We have to be careful with the words that we use, knowing that Christianity has sometimes been a proponent of anti-Jewish thought, which has led to violence. And as we're careful with our words, we also notice how the way we say things will make us want to distance ourselves from the readings. Like those people complained about Jesus, but we don't have a problem. When in fact, if you are diligent and loyal enough to show up to church in the middle of a pandemic, you are probably in some some part of yourself a religious insider yourself. And so as you hear the gospel today, consider how perhaps you have blocked your mind from hearing new parts of Jesus's identity, just as those religious insiders did way back when. So that tangent aside, going back to the idea of those moments of liturgical shock that we can sometimes have, those moments of surprise in our worship. Another memorable one for me came two years ago, also in this space. It was Easter morning, and I was about halfway through my pregnancy with our first son, Abe. I was standing behind the altar celebrating the Eucharist, and I held up the bread and said the ancient words of Jesus that I've said many times and heard for decades. I said, this is my body, broken for you. And I don't know what it was in that moment. I can't think of a conversation that would spark this, that had happened earlier in the week. 
But in that moment, I heard those words in an entirely different way than I ever had before. For my whole life, I've heard those words, this is my body broken for you, to refer to Jesus' death. And of course, this makes contextual sense because those words were spoken on the night before his death at his Last Supper. But for whatever reason, in that moment, as I held the bread in my hands and I was pregnant with my first child, I heard those words not speaking of Jesus' death, but referring instead to birth. I heard the words as if spoken from Jesus, our mother, this is my body, broken for you. Those words have stuck with me, and that experience has shaped and reshaped my faith in ways I couldn't imagine, especially as it comes to receiving the Eucharist. And so I began to read and learn more about this kind of way of approaching our faith, and I realized, like with many things associated with so ancient a practice, I was really late to the game. There were many people for centuries who have been meditating and writing and reflecting on this very idea. And in my studies, I found a book called This Is My Body, written by the scholar Hannah Shanks. And in it, she traced the history of this theology through all of Christianity, all the way back to the earliest church fathers, Clement of Alexandria being one who wrote about Eucharist and reflecting on it as Christ breastfeeding and nursing us through his body. Then she went on to explore how our patron Saint Paul used this imagery with gender fluid language, explaining to, that he was not ready to feed his congregants solid food. They were not ready, and he would continue to feed them through breast milk. Then in Galatians, Paul refers to himself as being in the pain of childbirth until his followers had Christ born and formed within them. And then there's an entire tradition within monasticism of this kind of visions and reflections and writings, some of which we sang moments ago in the words of Julian of Norwich, mothering God, you gave me birth, she wrote. Many monastics reflected on this experience through their prayers and visions, reflecting on Christ nursing us, reflecting on the wounds of his crucifixion as some kind of womb for us. They regularly exhorted their leaders in the monastic communities to model themselves off of the wisdom of mothers and midwives and women. And so this belief has ebbed and flowed in popularity through all the years of Christianity. But today it comes to us with direct relevance. As we hear Jesus tell us that he is the true bread of life, that his flesh is given for us for life eternal. And so as you hear these words today, consider how a mother feeds her child through blood in the placenta in the womb and with milk after the birth, how Jesus himself sustains us through his own body and his own blood. Consider how a woman and a mother carries her child in the womb until the safety of birth, how Jesus carries us within his own body, offering it to us again and again, this is my body broken for you, my blood given for you. And as you move through the rest of our worship today, may your hearts and minds and ears be open to the ways that the Holy Spirit might be here to surprise you, might shake you out of what you thought you believed, to hear something anew. As you feast on the bread of life, whenever that comes next, whether it's in the Eucharist to follow or in a coming week, reflect on how Christ's body was broken for you to birth you into a new and eternal life. Amen.